Hi, my name is David Weyburn and I'll be presenting a short video describing the boundary layer that forms on a wing in flight. In this video we will be avoiding most of the heavy math involved in aerodynamics of wings and just stick to the conceptual visualization of boundary layers on a wing. So let's get started. Boundary layers are formed when any fluid flows along a wall. The fluid velocity at the solid surface is reduced to zero due to friction. The velocity increases as you move away from the surface until you again reach the free stream velocity. This slow moving layer near the wall surface is called the boundary layer. The question is, what does the boundary layer look like on a wing? The approach we will be using in this video is new and not found in any textbook. But don't worry, we will lay it out in a way that will convince any doubters. To appreciate the new boundary layer model, we will start by reviewing the usual textbook approach. Most textbooks start by explaining flow over a thin flat plate, which is then transposed to the wing situation. So let's start there. Here's a cutaway drawing depicting 2D flow over a thin flat plate. The flow and the plate continue in and out of the XY plane. Assume air velocity U sub zero flows from left to right over the plate. A boundary layer develops along the plate due to viscous friction. Viscosity causes the velocity at the plate wall to be zero, the so-called no-slip boundary condition. If we look in a direction normal of the plate, the velocity increases from zero until it reaches the bulk flow value U sub zero. The boundary layer thickness delta is the point where the flow velocity essentially returns to the bulk flow value, here represented by the dashed line. The red line is the boundary layer velocity profile U, defined as the velocity at point x for all y. For flow over a wing, the thin flat plate boundary layer depiction is simply transposed to the normal to the wing surface. Okay, so some of you will have trouble believing what I'm about to say, but it is true, and we will discuss it in detail, and you can decide for yourself. The big reveal is that both the thin flat plate and the wing depictions are physically impossible. They do not happen in the way it is depicted on the plate or the wing. The problem has to do with the momentum balance. Let me explain. For fluid flow, we must have conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. What does conservation of momentum look like for boundary layers? The boundary layer forms because we have a no-slip boundary at the plate. If we had a slip boundary condition, then the bulk flow would extend all the way to the wall as if the plate was not there. For incompressible flow, the no-slip boundary condition means this small area here represents lost momentum due to the boundary layer. We have to have conservation of momentum, so the question is, where did this momentum go? If the velocity directly asymptotes to U sub zero, the answer is the missing momentum apparently disappears into another dimension or something. The textbooks never explain where it goes. Okay, let's be clear here. Any textbook depicting the boundary layer in this manner is just wrong. It cannot happen this way. So, we are back to the question of where does the momentum go? One possibility is to turn to what is often done in wind tunnel data. In wind tunnels, to account for intentionally induced pressure gradients, what is done is to change the asymptotic velocity to u sub e instead of u sub zero. u sub e is allowed to change with x due to changing pressure gradients along the wall. However, this just moves the momentum balance problem somewhere else. Since there is no upper y limit to u sub e, we replace the lost momentum with infinite momentum. Even if we try to set the y limit, the resulting flow depiction does not correspond to the real boundary layer fluid flow situation. So the textbook depiction approaches are not the answer to the momentum problem. What else might explain the missing momentum? Some of you will point out a portion of the missing momentum shows up as the generation of the normal velocity away from the plate. The pileup of slow moving near wall fluid results in a pressure imbalance, hence a vertical velocity. The Prandtl momentum equations tells us how this works. The momentum equations take the form of the Prandtl x momentum and y momentum balance equations shown here. 
the fast free stream flow encountering the slow moving boundary layer flow induces a pressure imbalance in the form of a pressure gradient in the boundary layer region. This gradient in turn generates a normal velocity v at x, y. You have to be careful here because some textbooks will try to convince you that the pdy is zero. This is simply not true near the boundary layer edge. Some of the flow is deflected upwards by the slow moving boundary layer flow. We will verify this experimentally, but before we go there, understand that we are not yet finished with the momentum balance equations. The normal velocity momentum will account for some of the momentum loss, but not all of it. Why do I say this? Because the pressure effects are not unidirectional. This means that the pressure imbalance generating the normal velocity should also generate an excess velocity in the x direction. This excess velocity will be noticeable just above the slow moving fluid, which in this case is just above the viscous part of the boundary layer. It is a little hard to visualize exactly how this would play out in a boundary layer. Perhaps the best way to see what is going on is from actual experimental measurements. And the best way to do that is to do some computer simulations. So here's what I did. I performed a series of full Navier-Stokes simulations of laminar flow in a channel. I used the open foam simulation software, which is freely available, and I was able to run it on my laptop. In order to simulate exterior flow, the simulations were done on two parallel thin flat plates 8 meters long, making a 2D channel. The channel was placed in a no-wall free stream of velocity u sub zero in order to correctly account for the effects of the inlet. The channel gap h was then increased until the velocities asymptoted to zero instead of linearly returning to zero at the channel center. Remarkably, this did not occur until h was increased to 200 meters for flow that had an exit Reynolds number just under the laminar to turbulent transition value. Here is a plot of the normal velocity v at x, y at three different locations along the channel. Notice that the normal velocity persists well above what is considered the boundary layer thickness, which in this case is about 2 to 5 centimeters. So the normal velocity generation is confirmed. Now consider the x direction velocity. Here is the plot of the excess velocity u minus u sub zero as a function of the normal direction at the same three locations. The velocity peaks just above what is usually considered the boundary layer thickness. This confirms the x direction excess velocity generation. There are three takeaways from this simulation. First, the fact that an excess x direction velocity exists means that u must peak. We deduce this using a simple momentum balance argument and have now confirmed it using experimental results. You will not find any mention of the velocity peaking in any textbook that I have seen. This is a remarkable observation. The second takeaway is that for exterior flows, the boundary layer is much thicker than traditionally believed. If we use the definition of the boundary layer as the region where the presence of the wall can no longer be felt in the free stream, then the boundary layer thickness is hundreds to thousands of times thicker than the traditional interpretation. In the experimental results just presented, the viscous boundary layer thickness is on the order of a few centimeters, but the peak slowly dissipates over many meters. The third takeaway from this result is, notice that the excess velocity in both cases is only about 0.1% of u sub zero. This tells us that the pressure imbalance affected the y and excess velocities about equally, just as we supposed. However, what is concerning is that the 0.1% is so small as to be almost impossible to measure in a wind tunnel. 0.1% is right at the noise level of the experimental velocity measurements. What is important to understand is that the 0.1% results are for a thin flat plate. Now let us consider what happens when we have flow around aerodynamically thick objects. When we start worrying about exposed cross-sectional areas to the flow, we are dealing with form drag. Check out the Wikipedia page drag followed by physics in parentheses for more info.
The aerodynamically thick objects means we physically divert a lot more momentum than just the boundary layer diverted momentum. As you might suspect, the extra momentum results in excess velocities that are much larger than the 0.1%. Here is a simulation of a thick flat plate. In this case, the rounded nose plate used by a group at Rolls-Royce to study laminar to turbulent transitions. You can download the open phone code and run it yourself. Okay, let me walk you through the results. What we see here are six velocity profiles taken at different points along the plate. The profiles on the left are the T3 plate profiles, and the ones on the right are the wind tunnel's top wall profiles. Looking at the profiles on the left, we see that the velocity peaks and then slowly declines. Peak levels are on the order of 2%. There is no way one can ignore this type of peaking behavior anymore. It is real, and it is experimentally measurable. And yet, it hasn't been reported this way. To understand why, I have replotted the same data in the right-hand figure, but in this case, I cut off the plot at the same y values as was reported for the actual T3A experiments by Rolls-Royce. The data is available on the web. The peaks now look like plateaus. This is the reason wind tunnel experimentalists adapted the U sub E formulation. They simply did not measure the velocity profile far enough above the plate to observe the peaking behavior. With the thin and flat plate results, we now have a pretty good idea of what is going on at an exterior boundary layer. Here is an updated depiction of the boundary layer for external flows along walls. The upper dashed line represents the point where the velocity peak essentially returns to the bulk flow value U sub zero. The lower dashed line represents the peak locations. Two points to be made here. First, in general, delta sub m is much bigger than delta sub max. This is due to the difference between viscous effects and the inertial effects. The viscous effects are confined to the very near wall region, whereas the inertial effects are long range. The other point to be made is that we show both dash lines originating at the plate edge. That almost certainly doesn't happen in general. We just did it for convenience. So, we have a good depiction of flow over plates. Now let us consider flow over a wing. It took us a while to get to this point, but finally we get to start talking about boundary layers on wings. We could just assume that what is happening at the wing surface is a simple 90 degree transpose from the flat plate result, as is done traditionally. But why do that? Let's instead study some simulation results directly. Here are some results from another computer flow simulation using OpenFoam. This simulation verification metric was to match lift coefficients and drag coefficients versus angle of attack to NASA's experimental results. The figure on the left shows a series of velocity profiles taken at various places along the wing surface. The one on the right is the same data but with a logarithmic scale to spread the peaks out a little bit. The peak heights vary from about 14% higher than U sub zero near the front of the wing to just a few percent larger near the tail of the wing. The inertial region thickness is very large due to the very slow return to U sub zero. The first 99% decrease from the peak happens in about one cord length above the wing, but the last 1% takes another nine or 10 cord lengths. What we end up with is a boundary layer velocity profile depiction on a wing that looks something like this. In general, the peak of the boundary layer is very close to the airfoil surface. For example, in the 54 meter per second air velocity simulation we just looked at, the peak location delta sub max is at about 0.02 cords from the wing surface near the leading edge. At the trailing edge, the peak is further away, more like 0.1 cord, except in the region right at the trailing edge. The peak slowly decays to U sub zero after about 10 cords, although, as I already noted, most of the peak is down by 99% after about one cord above the wing. The velocity above the peak is mostly inviscid and can be treated as potential flow. 
Why is this important? Why should we care if the boundary layer depiction is correct or not? The reason is that if we cannot properly account for the momentum in the boundary layer, then you have no chance to develop a theoretical explanation for aerodynamic lift. And that is where we are at today. Existing theoretical explanations of lift are basically hand-waving exercises. The traditional asymptotic U sub zero or U sub E plateau depictions can never get us to where we need to be. They do not provide a path that allows momentum balance to be part of the theory. The new boundary layer model, on the other hand, does do that. The new description provides the needed framework for a theory of aerodynamic lift. The new framework is only part of what is needed. You also have to be able to physically describe the thickness and shape of the boundary layer. The traditional delta 99 parameter is pretty much useless as a boundary layer thickness for flow on a wing. However, there is a relatively new way to describe the thickness and shape of the boundary layer that provides the needed analytics. It borrows from the method for describing probability functions using integral moments. Check out my YouTube video, A New Way to Describe Boundary Layer Thickness and Shape, or the Wikipedia page, Boundary Layer Thickness. Okay, that's it. Thanks for tuning in. The results presented here are based on a series of U.S. Air Force technical reports listed here. They are freely available on the web and I will include links in the description section below.